Hello and welcome to the Healing with Charlie podcast, where we chat about all things healing, attachment theory, and no contact. I'm your host, Charlie, and today we're chatting with my great friend, Brittany Basinski. Brittany, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, It's great to have you on. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. So it's always so nice to catch up. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. For all of the uh, listeners and viewers, Brittany is a best-selling author and writer. She's also the host of the Defiant Human podcast and generally speaking, an all-around badass entrepreneur mom. Brittany and I first connected a little over one year ago when she invited me to be on her podcast. So today we've kind of come full circle. I'm really excited for this. And it's great to have you here with us today as Brittany's going to essentially share like her insights and basically help us lead more fulfilling lives, especially trying to overcome some of the curveballs that life can throw you when you least expect them. So Brittany, thank you so much for coming on today. Why don't you kick things off by telling everyone a little bit about who you are and what you've been up to lately? Yeah, gosh, that's such an intro, man. It's so funny because, you know, like you said, we did this a year ago, so it's not my norm to be on the other side of the mic, but I love it. And again, like I love catching up with you. A lot has happened. A lot has happened. You know, when we did connect, we were both in no contact with our, our exes. And um, I had just began going through a new chapter of divorce, you know, so I've been divorced for, um, it'll be exactly a year, like legally in April, but we separated in July of 2022. So yeah, I've been navigating, um, life, dating, motherhood, single motherhood, and then just, you know, the the creator's journey and the the writer's journey, the artist's journey, I guess, and entrepreneurship. So I'm kind of doing a lot of different things, um, but that's just like typical me fashion. Um, So I appreciate, I appreciate the intro. It's really nice. I felt, I feel seen by you as I'm sure a lot of your our followers feel that. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And as I mentioned, like yours was the first podcast I was ever on. Um, it felt really exciting to even have that offer extended to me, especially like back then. I think I only had like around 30,000 followers on TikTok. I was still kind of relatively new and kind of figuring out what it is I even wanted to do. And so that whole experience kind of helped me see like, oh, there's a way I can like turn this into a career. Like I can make this sort of like, like a side hustle or even a main hustle. And that's kind of what you're you're basically all about. Like you transitioned away from working, you know, part-time jobs, full-time jobs to sort of getting paid to exist, which is the name of your course. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about like your journey? What what led you to become like a writer and content creator, entrepreneur? Like what are some of the hardships along the way? I'm sure everybody would be interested in learning about that. Yeah, well, gosh, um, wanting to be a writer was definitely something that I felt pulled towards in like the first grade, I was seven. So I knew it was like this pivotal moment where I knew like, this is my thing. I It, it was like I was struck by lightning that day. And I was never the same after it. We had this exercise in, in our first grade class. And she gave us a blank white book and said to fill it with whatever stories you want. It was my first time ever really like, you know, writing, doing like a creative writing practice. And I was just in love and I was in love from that moment forward. I would, I was like the nerdy girl that would stand and write little short stories and poetry and I would journal every day. So I feel like that's just always been who I am. And so I've never really like stopped once I started, I I've never really stopped, but I think like a lot of creators, a lot of writers, like I told myself I had writer's block or I had these, I gave myself, you know, excuses to step away from the craft or I wasn't good enough or I'd never be good enough. Um, So I got away from it and I really got away from myself. And I think the journey, the artist journey or just the human journey as you grow and evolve, it's just kind of coming back to that inner child. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that is really kind of how like the paid to exist to entrepreneurial journey um, came about too. I had like a spiritual awakening when I was, I was like 24 years old. I was working in corporate America. I did all the things. I colored in all the lines. I did what I was supposed to do. I got the job, the nine to five, and I just was so unfulfilled. And I, that was during the time where I really wasn't reading books. I really wasn't writing books. I told myself I was just an adult and I had to like, you know, do adult things. And writing was just like a silly hobby that I'd never make it in. And so, um, 
you know, that was kind of like before my spiritual awakening. And then I had my spiritual awakening and, um, it was that moment where I woke up to my desires and it was like, I don't know if you had like a spiritual awakening, but it's like, once you kind of become, like you wake up to who you are and what this world and this life is all about, you can't really go back. So I had like seen too much. I knew too much. It was like one day I woke up and I knew the nine to five just wasn't for me. And so I started, um, building clients. Like, you know, I just, I filed for like my LLC. I really didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I just knew I didn't want to work for anybody. So this was back when I was like 24, 25 ish. And I, I created an LLC and I just started doing like freelance writing, freelance creative for other people. And slowly I just kept, um, pivoting and trusting like whatever little, like, n- like nudge or intuitive pull, like that was going to be my next thing. That was going to be my next thing. And so I went from like freelance creative to, I was a content creator back when I only had like 2000 followers on Instagram. Um, before like 2020 even, you know, uh, and I was getting paid like great for, I mean, this is crazy. So I was making content for brands and I did brand deals and brand work, um, like the influencer thing, I guess you could say. So I did that. And then I just, you know, like I slowly evolved and I found like the things that I like. And so, yeah, I guess like the whole thing about being paid to exist is like turning your passions into profit. So my passions have changed and I've profited off of whatever it is in the moment that I'm passionate about. I've figured out a way to do that. And so for me right now, it's like, it's writing, um, it's building other streams of like passive income to really provide that financial stability as an artist and creator so that I can feel secure. I can pay my bills. I can put food on the table, but I also can have the time freedom and financial freedom to travel and create and live like the true artist life that like my inner child has always wanted. Wow, that's that's really great. And the part I like about that the most is like how you kind of equated it to getting back in touch with your inner child. Um, I feel like it's a like one moment that anybody that's intuitively in touch with themselves experiences in life. And when they realize that it's not something they can ignore, they can't really go back to the old way that they used to live. Like I had that moment when I was like in my twenties and I always knew like I wanted to do something creative. I wanted to do something expressive. And I naturally ignored that at first because I was believing the narratives that everyone around me was telling me, like, your creative job is going to be impossible to get. It's going to be so hard. You're not going to make any money and you're going to be unhappy. And I actually believed a lot of that. And I went and I did the cliche thing of like going to school, getting the degree and doing the thing that you don't really resonate with, but you're just doing because you think it's what you should be doing. And when you have that aha moment, you almost have like a rejection of your body where you're like, no, I I physically cannot do this. And it's incredible that you actually pushed through that. So I'm kind of curious, and I, I go through this as well, being in the healing space, I do a lot of learning about uh, like attachment theory and trauma, but I'd never consider myself like a therapist or a counselor. So I'm curious, like how, if at all, have you pushed through like the challenges with like imposter syndrome or feeling like you don't belong because you're trying to like tread a new territory that you haven't experienced before. Yeah, no, this is so funny because this is such a theme that I'm currently going through right now as I see more success. And um, so I've had a therapist. That's one thing I'll say right off the bat is like, I've had a therapist for probably the last eight years of my life. And it started when I was getting these like debilitating panic attacks and anxiety attacks. But like you said, though, that was like the physical manifestations of my body rejecting my life. And I had no idea. I just knew like, I don't like feeling this way. And I didn't know what to do. So starting therapy really helped me with that. But something that my therapist Tina and I are working through is imposter syndrome. And um, because I don't think that ever leaves, especially because as you grow, you're getting better and better. You're seeing more results. Maybe you're, you're making more money. Yeah. Your platforms are growing. Your books are selling more. And you kind of feel like, oh, crap, someone's going to find out that I'm just like a normal person like they are, that I'm not like some whatever, right? Like what, whatever category you're putting me in, like I'm just a normal person and I, and I struggle and I, you know, I have my own insecurities and I'm working through it. 
So that is a theme that I'm working through right now because, you know, I'll tell you, like, when I wake up sometimes, a current struggle I'm feeling is, like, I've built such a life that I love so deeply that it doesn't feel real. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's like, um, and, it, and that's, I guess, a different type of imposter syndrome to my own self. I'm like, is this even real? Are we even here? Are we really, like you know, making our seven-year-old self proud right now, writing books every day. Like, did we do this for real? You know, so I'm dealing with that right now. And I think how I deal with that is just knowing, like, it's always going to be there. And if you've ever listened to, like, other podcasts or, like, you know, high achievers or celebrities or anybody that you really look up to, they all have the same feeling where it's, like, someone's going to find out that, you know what I mean? So... It's just knowing that it's always going to be there and just pushing through anyways, you know? Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. It, like, it never really goes away. And it almost feels like the bigger you grow and the more successful you become, it's harder to not ignore when somebody points that out. It almost feels like, wow, they're seeing the very thing that I try to, in a way, hide on the surface, right? Like, for example, I'll sometimes have comments on social media being like, who is this guy? And who is he to talk about relationships and attachment theory? What are his qualifications? And like, I get that there is a certain level of knowledge and experience that's required with talking about relationships and trauma and attachment theory, but also personal growth. And I think the one of the best things that's been for me is to just just reassure myself and to know like as you said it's not going to go away like it's always going to be there and you're always going to have somebody questioning that but you just have to kind of push through it it's kind of like you have to be a little delusional to yourself you have to like convince yourself of the otherwise that you're doing fine. You've gotten here so far. So I really like that because it's sort of like an underdog story that you have where you, you came up from this other world where many people I told, I assume told you throughout the course had said, I don't think this is the right choice. Are you, is something going on in your life? And that is one thing I feel a lot of people will do when you try to actually change something about your life. They make you doubt and question. And it's a common theme that can come up in relationships as well, which is kind of what I want to talk about next, like a little bit more about your personal experiences, because it seems like a lot of the work that you've done is sort of influenced by those personal experiences. like the most obvious being your most recent book about um, getting back to him and finding that old love again. And I'm kind of curious, maybe you can explain what that book was about. Yeah, so I will definitely go back and touch on that point where you said that the the work that I do and the way that I live my life, my relationships have a thousand percent affected me and impacted the work that I do, like leaving my marriage, for example, um, that changed everything for me. Um, my world kind of blew open and I'm able to kind of see things differently and live the life that I want to live. But when I was in that, I did have the voice that's like, who do you think you are? You know? Um, so I, I definitely had that and breaking away from relationships that I didn't feel understood or I didn't feel seen was really important for me and my growth. And then something else to touch about relationships there, because I think it's important is, um, and I'm working on this it, through therapy right now is that as a content creator, as you know, um, or just someone who ha- has a deeper calling in life that they like, you know, I have a, I have a voice, I have a message or something for me to say. And I, what you said, like, well, who do you think you are? That, that is the imposter syndrome. But also I think um, something that I'm trying to do right now is just connect more with creatives who get it because there's that saying, like, never take advice from someone who isn't like two steps ahead of you or someone who never, never receive life advice from someone whose life you don't aspire to have. Right. So that's something I think that I'm currently trying to weed out. It's like, I'm not taking advice from anybody who's not doing what I'm doing. I'm very like, I'm very protective over my energy and my time. And I don't spend time with people who just don't get it. And so that's something my therapist has helped me realize. She's like, you know, the people who talk about you on social media or, you know, they want to pretend that they don't see you or they, they, they don't support your work. It's because they just don't understand it. And you just gotta like look past and find your people who understand. 
So there's that. And then, I'm sorry, what was the other thing? Uh, kind of like uh, your most recent book and how it's sort of based on your personal experiences. Yeah, I think um, for me, like writing and art is just a way to process my feelings and what I'm going through with life. I'm a cancer zodiac, so it's like such a cancer thing to say. <laughs> but it is like we have a lot of feelings, okay? And so my writing process is really like a, a super cathartic one. So um, a book that I wrote and published back in May of um, 2023 was loosely written about um, and tied to a real life story where I lost my first love. He passed away. Um, the story kind of blew up because I also went viral on TikTok for that book. I shared that um, my first love called me before we got, before I got married. He called me right before my wedding and said, don't marry him. And there was, it's so ironic that there was like a TikTok sound. I said, like, don't marry him. And it like gave me chills. So I was like, this is my experience. Like he called me before, um, before I got married and he's like, don't marry him. And I'm like, you've had four or five years to tell me this and I'm getting married like in a couple days. And it was just this haunting experience where like, I kind of like intuitively, I knew the guy that I was marrying like, wasn't, he just wasn't my love. Um, but the guy who called me was, and basically um, I filed for divorce, you know, last year. And um, more than anything, I wanted to call him back and be like, you were right, but he actually passed away in 2019. So that stirred up a lot within me um, because, you know, I think in life, it's not always the things that you do that you regret. It's the things that you don't do. And so I was grappling with this deep regret of like, gosh, like the love of my life is dead. I'm getting a divorce. Um, and it was just this really deeply painful, lonely, heartbreaking thing that I was going through. And so I just channeled that into art and it's really resonated with a lot of people. I think a lot of people can resonate with that story of like the one that got away. And so unfortunately, like I'm living proof of like what that is like. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was the last book. And I'm still, still writing more books, um, you know, turning my feelings, my, my pain into purpose, I guess. So that's amazing. And I, I like the story of how you drew on your real life experiences and channeled it into art. And instead of letting it just be this like challenging traumatic event that happened to you, it sort of happened for you. And you found a way to grow from it and find meaning in it. And I feel like that's kind of similar for both of us. Like when I started posting on TikTok, I was going through that difficult breakup and I was just posting about the challenges I was experiencing day to day. And a lot of people resonate with that. And I feel like for your audience, a lot of people resonate with like being a mother, being an entrepreneur, trying to provide while also trying to fulfill your life for yourself. And so I'm kind of curious, like managing all of those, like keeping all of those plates spinning, what are some of the strategies you learned to effectively keep everything up and afloat while still feeling like you have your own identity? Because speaking as, you know, someone with anxious attachment, we can be very easy for us to lose ourselves in the things that we do and the relationships that we have. And for a lot of moms that I've spoken to, they feel like their kids are their everything. And when those kids grow up and go off to school, suddenly they struggle with what to do with their life. And it's a really common pain point for a lot of people. And fortunately, that can be a time when a lot of couples get separated and divorced, right? And so I'm kind of curious, like now that you have sort of cut away a lot of the relationships that don't benefit you, what are the ways you're trying to manage all of those ones that are still there effectively while still uh, having your own personal life outside of all of that? Yeah. So I think there's like a few questions in there. I'm going to try to answer them the best that I can. It's like, how do I manage doing all the things, right? Entrepreneurial, artistic, relational, um, and also be a mom and like provide. And that is a challenge. And honestly, when I think about it, I'll, and I try really hard not to do this. Um, I try really hard not to say them all out loud at once or even like write it all out in like one whole thing. What I like to do is there's this like analogy. I don't know who told me this, but they're like, how do you eat a whale? Have you heard this one? No. 
how do you how do you eat a whale one bite at a time right when you think about there's this giant whale there's no way you could possibly eat an entire whale in one sitting or how it could take a really long time to eat that whale but it's possible one bite at a time and so someone told me that and it just it really helps when i like for me to get out of my head and the best way that I'm able to like have a podcast and I'm writing two books right now and I'm raising two children on my own and I'm providing a roof over our head and groceries in the fridge. And, um, you know, I show up on social media just about every day in my stories and entertain and, you know, connect with my people. I think, um, and I have other business, other businesses on the side that I don't even talk about, you know, that bring passive income. And I think it's just that, doing one thing at a time and knowing I have all these little buckets and, you know, I think writing a book was the biggest lesson in how to manage my life because you have to break everything down in really small bites, really small pieces and really break it down. So like, how do you write a book? Well, a book is roughly anywhere from 50 to 90,000 words. And when you think about it out loud, a book is pretty thick, right? You're like, oh my God, I got to write this whole book. But you think about 365 days, you think about simple math. So 50,000 words, if I wrote a thousand words in 50 days, I could write an entire book in 50 days. Doesn't that sound so much easier when you say in 50 days, if I showed up for 50 days and I wrote 1,000 words, I could have an entire first draft. So it's really just knowing how to like time manage and time block. Like, all right, well, I know I'm writing this book. My disciplined goal, and I think this one's huge, is I'm going to show up and write a thousand words today, a thousand words tomorrow, or I'll make, I'll set a goal. I I need to write 10,000 words in two weeks. So that's how I'm able to like manage that. And then I just really break it down. Like, okay, I'll do one podcast this week. I will make sure that I hit my admin stuff, you know, from one to three on Monday. And I've got, you know, Bob's basketball game to throw in. And so I've got a lot of stuff that I'm doing, but it's just breaking them down into really small tasks. And I write down the smallest of things. Like I even put down every day, like little things so I don't forget. And I remember to take care of myself, which is another thing that you said, like mothers, we're, it's so intrinsic for us to give, 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 nurture, nurture, nurture that we can deplete ourselves. So it's becoming aware having self-awareness and knowing when you're feeling that and even trying the better thing to do is to get ahead of that feeling of feeling depleted so i even will write down in my planner every day um meditate journal uh exercise little things um and every day i write meditate and i do i it's a daily practice that i do even if it's five minutes a day i meditate every single day that is like my self-care thing that i have to do and I write it down so I know it's as important as a doctor's appointment that I get this thing in for myself. Um, I think it's meditate journal. And there's something else that I that I've been writing down. Oh, read five pages a day. I'm really big on like personal growth, so that's another thing too. It's like, well, how could you possibly read like a stack of books and write and do this? And it's like, it's easy. You can read a whole book every month if you read five pages a day, just five simple mm-hmm. pages. And so when you take that mental shift to like wow, like, I don't know how you're able to do all these things. It's like, well, we've got 24 hours in the day. And if we can break them down as small little things, and we also prioritize like our self care, we're making sure we're meditating, we're journaling, we're, you know, setting up the appointment for therapy, uh, setting up the appointment to get our teeth cleaned, like little things, putting yourself, you know, like, you're important, and you can't take care of a family or anyone else, be a good friend, be a good mother, be a good father, whatever, if you're not really taking care of yourself. I think that is a huge lesson that I've had to learn. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And I think that's a lesson for anyone struggling with anxious attachment could really benefit from because we can get so caught up in the other person in how they're showing up or not showing up or what they're thinking and what they're feeling that we can often forget about ourselves. And it's a common telltale sign of the anxious avoidant relationship is it becomes so codependent that people tend to um, lose sight of their hobbies or passions and goals, even their friends, right? And so shifting focus over to your personal life a little bit, when you have all of that that you're juggling, how do you even find the time to date? 
how do you even find the time to like go on the apps or find someone that's even worth getting to know? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. So the good news is like, if you're a single divorced mom, I have 50, like, it's so funny because I have two lives. I have two lives. I have like the mom life where when my kids are with me, like four days straight, um, I'm all in, you know, like I, I chose the entrepreneurial life so that I could be a very present hands-on mom. So I'm the mom that's like, you know, I'm, the, I'm like the sideline mom, like cheering, like I'm in it with my kids. I, I haven't missed a thing. And that was super important to me. And I've always felt called to motherhood. So like, I'm there, I'm a hundred percent on, um, when I don't have them, I'm just like anyone else, you know, I, I'm just like a normal like early thirties girl out there in the wild, like just dating and, or like a single person, right? Like your, your typical single girl, when I don't have my kids, I'm like bed riding on Sunday sometimes, you know, like I'm going out with girls. Um, but yeah, so like, it's been interesting. And I think dating as a single mom comes with, there's a lot to be said here, Charlie. I don't know. Um, I don't know how, how deep we, we can really get here, but it's been interesting because I think being a single mom, you can attract certain types of men. Oh yeah. You know, that's definitely true. And, uh, while <laughs> I haven't personally dated single moms, I've been friends with single moms who have said a very similar experience. So th this is, this is totally an open space. Feel free to be as open okay. as you would like. And that this is kind of when you and I sort of connected, like you were yeah. kind of going through that separation and you were going through that moment where you're like, you know what, I'm going to prioritize myself. I'm going to have fun and it's going to be wild. And you and I, we were riffing back and forth about some of our dating experiences. And for those listening or watching, spoiler alert, it was an emotional roller coaster for both of us. Um, I believe for you, there was, there was whole foods guy, which your audience loved. <laughs> There was there was the spiritual guy. Those are the last two that I remember. But uh, aside from that, there were so many other people in and through that you can really lose sight of like how many people you have to go through until you find somebody that is really worth just saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to stick with you for a little while. And that's partly because of like who we are as people and the types of people we – for – lack of a better way of saying it, who we attract. And we have no control over that, unfortunately. So why don't you go into uh, a little bit about maybe some of the, uh, you know, people that kind of find their way toward you? Mm, oh, uh, that's a great question. So yeah, uh, yes, I'm laughing because when we talked a year ago, I was very much in like an on again, off again relationship with the guy that I ran into at Whole Foods. And so I'll back up and say like the dating app thing was just, I'm currently not on them because I, yeah, like the people that I attracted on dating apps just were not it. They just weren't it. The people that I attracted in real life, I'm realizing like, though that's the real deal. Like it's, it's that it's even like the whiff of pheromone that you pick up like in person that you can't, you don't get that on a dating app. So yeah, like a year ago, I was on, in a very intense on again, off again relationship with a guy that I bumped at Whole, into at Whole Foods. Um, and what made it so interesting was the age gap. And um, that was a challenge because I think had he had been older or me younger, um, who knows where this where the relationship would be right now. But I think because I actually, be, I think it's my energy. I'm, I attract in men. And um, I don't know really what it is, but I vibe the, the most with younger men so far. Um, and most of my dating track record has been, I'll just, this is on record. So <laughs> no one knows this, but it's really men from like 24. Well, he's 24 now, but when we started, he was 23. He was 23. I didn't know. Okay, let me back up. I didn't know. We bumped carts at Whole Foods. It was the super meet cute. You don't know how old someone is when you bump into them. You just don't. So we vibed. We went on a date. And I was like, oh, crap. You are so much younger than me. I'll never see you again. But then we kept seeing each other. And then that's when I would be in your DMs, like, crying, like, Charlie, I don't know what to do. 
Um, because he was so avoidant and I was so anxious at the time. Um, but yeah, so that has shifted to where like now I don't know if it's heartbreak or me just healing. I'm more of a secure person. And so when I come across an anxious type, I, well, you know, we, we both found out that you and I are fear, fearful avoidance and I had to find out therapy. I thought I was just anxious because this relationship made me so anxious because he was a dismissive avoidant. And so he triggered the anxious side of me that I'd never felt before. I never even, I was never like that until I met him um, because he was so far on the avoidant pendulum that it triggered my abandonment wounds. And I was like, oh, that must mean, and I would just ruminate and then I would get near DMs and really help, you know. <laughs> um, but now, like, as I've healed and I've, you know, pulled away from that relationship a little bit, um, I realize that I'm becoming more secure. And in that, though, I'm attracting more anxious type of men. And are you realizing that, too? Like, you're attracting more of an anxious type and... I don't know. It's almost like, would I rather be an avoidant or an anxious? I don't know. Yeah, well, we'll definitely go into those types of questions near the end. But I, I totally resonate with like that whole experience because it's kind of like, um, like I like to think of attachment theory and attachment styles as sort of like fluid states of existence where you're not always locked into one style for the rest of your life. And what you said about anxious people thinking they're anxious until they meet somebody who is maybe equally as anxious, then they come to realize, oh crap, I am actually kind of avoidant as well. Uh, realistically, I think most anxious people have more avoidant traits in them. They're just not necessarily being brought out because of the people that they're dating, the people that they're with, or the sort of like the impressions that they carry with them into relationships. And so I have found that as I became more secure, I have attracted more anxious people. And it was really crazy because I used to think like, oh, I would rather date an anxious person over an avoidant any day. But when you actually date someone with a severe anxious attachment style, you do not realize what avoidance go through until you're actually in that setting. And that was an eye-opening experience for me because when I was starting content, I was so deep in my anxious side that I felt like I wanted to validate anxious people until I started going really heavy with dating and meeting all types of different people and becoming more secure because of therapy. I started to attract anxious people and I realized, oh, I can understand why people rely on certain avoidant tactics to create space for themselves in relationships and why they get pushed away when they're dating anxious types. And that was a total shift in my content strategy, uh, speaking as like a creator, because then I realized there's this whole other niche, this whole other side. And realistically, anxious and avoidance are two sides of the same coin, while fearful avoidance are just off doing their own little thing. And that's kind of how I came into where I am now. I am still considered a fearful avoidant, but I do consider myself to be more secure now with how I am able to show up thanks to things like therapy and just working on myself, but also coaching other people. It's kind of shown me, oh, I thought I had it bad. These people have it much worse. And it's kind of like a dose yeah. of reality. And so I would say that dating for me has has realistically not been that great on the dating apps specifically. The day I decided to get off the apps was like the most refreshing day of my life because I wasn't worried about checking them. I wasn't worried about if people read my messages or if this person actually liked me. Like those fears suddenly went away. And I think what kind of makes attachment styles much worse is sort of the ways in which people are creating relationships. It's sort of centered around this whole sort of econ economy based on scarcity. And when you have dating apps with their algorithms, it makes people feel like, oh, this person's really hot or they seem really fun. I hope they swipe me back. It already creates this sort of sentiment that 
you have to maybe win the lottery. And if they do pick you, it says so much about you amongst everyone else on the platform. And it it doesn't set people up for success. And that is the biggest thing that I learned and motivated me to get off those apps. And when I did that, I started to meet more secure people. They exist out there. They're just not always on the apps because they realize like those dating apps, they're a cesspool. They are a terrible way to meet people. And it's really just a breeding ground for avoidance. Realistically, it's people that want quick and cheap thrills that can come and go and they always have that next option in their pocket because the phone is right there. And I know a lot of female listeners, maybe even a lot of the male listeners and viewers who have dated someone that they met on a dating app can understand how awkward it can be when you have to have that conversation of, okay, we've been seeing each other for a while. We, When do we decide to get off the app? Do we even decide that at all? And sometimes they find out that their partner doesn't get off that app and that's a whole mess in itself. So getting off those apps is probably the best decision you can ever make for your dating life. And personally for me, when I learned that the people out there in the real world were more secure, it actually showed me what was most important in relationships and what I liked and didn't like. And so with that said, What's actually happened in my life is me and the ex that kickstarted this whole healing journey for me have gotten back together because then I realized, oh, the grass isn't as green as I thought it was going to be. And when she went out and started dating, she realized that the same about myself. And so I don't want to like come on here and say like, you know, do no contact, get your ex back. That's really not my message. It's like sometimes you need to come apart in order to realize like how good you really had it with someone else. And sometimes you need to get divorced and that doesn't mean you need to get back together, but you realize there is much better out there too. So given that whole experience that you've had, um, what would you say are some of the biggest lessons you've learned about yourself while you've been dating? Well, I just want to like do a little round of applause for that whole bit on leaving dating apps and how it's a breeding grounds for avoiding because it's a little harsh, yeah. but yeah, it's kind of true. No, you're so right. And it's funny because it's not funny. It's interesting because I think like the female experience and the male experience in dating apps are so different. It's so different. For me, I just felt like dating apps were set up for men, not really women. And I didn't feel like any connection I ever had was true and honest. And like, I don't know female empowered. I just didn't feel like the guys on there valued me as a woman. They kind of saw me, no matter where or how much I changed my, my specifications or if I said I had kids or if I didn't or whatever, I still would come across the guy who was just sliding in to like hook up. And it was like, you know, no, like I'm done. And so I, I really deeply resonated with what you said when you felt that relief from deleting dating apps like I felt that too it was like you know what I'm, I'm a very spiritual person so I'm like I'm surrendering this like I want love like everybody wants love and I want a relationship just like the next person but like you know and I'll say this too with dating and this is what I've realized um you know and I believe in soulmates so I'll say that like I I'm I said I'm a cancer I believe in soulmates. I write romance. Okay. Like I love love. If there's anybody on here that loves love, it's me. It's your girl. I love love. Okay. Um, getting off dating apps and figuring out. So yes, like leaving a marriage that was not serving me knowing my soulmate would never do that. My soulmate would never act this way. Treat me like this. Say this, do that. Knowing and like writing down like a specific list of what I'm looking for in a partner. And when someone shows up and they're not that, that's not my soulmate. So, uh, and I knew I'm not going to find my soulmate on a dating app. So when I got off, um, I had, this was like a practice. Like if I want to meet my soulmate, I've got to find, I, I will likely find him where I like to spend time. I will likely find him in places that I enjoy being. And it has pushed me to live a more rich and full life um, in real life, because I think so often we can just get it sucked in our phones and, and, you know, like it, 
made me more of a lazy dater and now I'm more of like a proactive dater where it's like I and and I haven't and this is another shift too like in dating for me like I have recently decentered men. I'm not making the focus of my life um I hope I meet a guy today or I'm going to go to this because I want to meet a guy. It's like I actually have yin yoga tonight at 7:15. If there is a guy there tonight, great. If not, I love yin yoga. And I joined a writer's workshop because I love writing and I want to socialize and meet people and fill my life so full of the things that I love to do that have pushed me to be more social because I can tend to be a little bit more introverted um, and a little bit more avoidant. And so I'm pushing the boundaries within myself and I'm doing more things in real life. And, you know, I think that has been such such a wonderful and healthy practice for me to like decenter men. Focus on the things that bring me joy, fill my life up with as many good things. And I truly believe that I will meet my person because of these new, this new shift that I'm doing. Um, and I also like the 12 grapes under <laughs> the table, like everybody else did on TikTok. So we're going to have this for reference that when I meet my person this year, it's, uh, it's because of the grapes too. <laughs> Really awesome. I, I like that because it, it's not that you're saying in dating that men aren't important. Like it's an important aspect, whether you're attracted to men or any other gender that's out there. It's it's really about not making it the focal point of dating. It's not the other person. And I think that's why a lot of people can lose themselves in the pursuit. They can really approach dating from a sense of scarcity and also from a sense of desperation. And that can really turn off a lot of people and it can prevent maybe some great opportunities from happening altogether. And when you really just focus on living your life and you kind of detach from the outcome, which is usually what I preach when people are going through no contact is don't focus on getting your ex back, just focus on living your life. Be the best version of yourself that you want to be, not necessarily the best version that you can be. And when you do that, you might find that life throws some interesting people your way that are more aligned with your energy and your life goals. And it seems like you're well on that path right now. Considering all of that um, and the fact that you're becoming more secure, there is still potential for people like us to fall back into old habits, especially if we find the wrong person. So I'm curious, uh, like, how has like your old attachment style shown up in dating while you've been healing? And what are some of the strategies you've used to continue healing your attachment style as you've been out on the scene? So my old attachment style would be just like um, a deeply triggered, anxious response. And really, uh, it just comes down to when I'm in contact with someone who does that, who triggers me in that way. I don't, I have not felt that um, with anyone. Although I will say like, if I'm communicating, when I was communicating with other guys that I liked, and you know that like pull away where you know they're like not feeling it all of a sudden. And it's this like fear of rejection where you're like, oh, kind of like kick to the gut. You're like, I know where this is headed. Then I can, and I don't like triple text or anything. Like I'm still very secure and how I like hold my emotions and how I like carry myself through communication. But internally, uh, the brain's on fire. Everything's, you know, um, I, I don't like it. And I think it comes down to like, a rejection wound, like that abandonment when I feel like someone maybe doesn't like me or they just realize like, mm, she's not a good fit for me. And that's such a normal, healthy response. I'm, it's called the one for a reason. Like most of them, 99% of the people you're going on dates with aren't it. And, but it still hurts, you know, I think. And that's when I maybe will feel the anxious tendencies if I'm maybe not the one in control or doing the rejecting myself or like the, hey, thanks, but no thanks. When it's the other way around where like maybe I kind of like that person, but and even if I didn't really like them and they, they don't like me for I'm not a good fit for them, it, it can be hard to no one likes to feel rejected. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely attest to a few times where I met some people that I were like, I thought, oh, they're really cool. They're interesting. I could see it going somewhere only to have it end abruptly. And then that sort of stinging for a little bit longer than if someone had just said like, hey, you're awesome. And then suddenly ghost me. Like, I feel like I can deal with ghosting a lot better than when someone says, you know what, you're amazing, but I don't think that this is right for me. I can totally respect that. But it kind of sucks either way when you have like a little bit of an attachment to them. You are you can see where it would be fun, even if it's only momentary, but it really just does sting nonetheless. And it brings up those old wounds of like rejection, rejection and abandonment. And I feel like Going through dating is really just like exposure therapy. The more you get rejected, the better you become at handling it, and the more that starts to heal you as well, because you tend to take it less personal. You don't see it necessarily as like a, a judgment on who you are as a person, and you can just continue to show up and say, hey, you know what, that wasn't the one. There will be another one, and eventually I will find the one. And I, I think you're kind of getting to that place right now. Like that's really amazing to hear, considering the Brittany I was in contact with like a year ago was very much not in that headspace. And it's been great to see you grow. Um, even take like time away from social media because that has been helpful. I feel like for yourself as well, because uh, both of us as creators, it can be really easy to become consumed with work and content. And when you sort of interlink dating with that, it's really hard to think like, oh, I need to take a step back because it's so intertwined, right? So that kind of leads me into my my next point about like uh, personal boundaries. And this is part of dating. You learn what your personal boundaries are and um, sort of the limits of those boundaries. So I'm kind of curious for a lot of the listeners out there, what are some important boundaries in dating that you absolutely cannot live without? Mm. Well, this is something that I've learned through dating and figuring out what are my needs and how do I respond to different types of people? And I think that has been helpful to see the, the way that different types of people are, how they communicate, how they show up um, in relationships, and then taking all of that kind of data and realizing, like, I like when someone does this, and I really do not like it when someone does this. So for me, um, I really appreciate my, my own personal boundaries. I really appreciate when someone has their own life. And this is such like a fearful avoided thing to say. It's like, please have your own things. I do not want to be the center of your world. I do not want to be, I do not want that pressure, nor do I need that pressure to be your one and only. Um, I recently kind of was like seeing a guy and it was like instantly he wanted to make me the center of his universe way too quickly. And he was, he was, he fit the bill. He was tall, dark, handsome, romantic. He was all these things, but internally, I got the ick so bad because I was like, you are making me way too important before you know enough about me. And that doesn't, that's one that's just not attractive. It's very polarizing for women for you to do that. So I did not like that um, because I think there's nothing more attractive than someone who really deeply loves their life and they're passionate about it because I am a firm believer that if you're passionate about the things that you do, you're going to be a passionate lover. And I love me some passion. So I love someone who has passion really enjoy the life that they're living because if they're whining and complaining or they're not happy, that's just kind of like a cancer. And that's going to come into my world and bring negativity and energy that's just not conducive to the type of life I want and that I'm building for myself. Um, so I'm really looking for like complementative energy. I want someone who can like physically on an energetic level keep up with me. I'm pretty, you know, like physical and fit and healthy. And I want someone who can like physically keep up with me. Um, but yeah, I'm looking for someone who is like emotionally available, emotionally mature, um, you know, can hold themselves accountable and yeah, who has their own life. And, and something else too, as, as far as like personal boundaries is because I do know my attachment style and it not only does it show up in romantic relationships, uh, it shows up in my friendships and in my family as well. And so I can lean more avoidant if I get that like emotionally heavy text, it, you're not going to hear from me right away because I'm going to have to digest that process it 
And I want to give a thoughtful response. It's not that I don't see it. It's not that I don't love you. It's not that I don't care. It's that this is something that I do care about. And it's going to take me some time to thoughtfully respond. And so communicating with my friends, with my family, and even when I'm out with a guy and I'll ask him, do you know your attachment style? And he might not, but I will, within a week, I will know. I'm like, you are very anxious. And I, I think you're great. And I understand why you're anxious. And I understand you because I lean more secure. So I can be understanding and like, I get it. Um, but it's just communicating like, hi, um, this is the way that I operate. I need a lot of space. I need a lot of space, a lot of time to myself. I've got my own like robust life going. And I don't necessarily want to see you three days a week. That's kind of a lot when we first get to know someone. Like I prefer like once a week. And so just communicating like I don't want to feel smothered by you. Um, I kind of am feeling smothered by you. And I, it's no offense. I understand why you might feel that way. Um, but just kind of going into like even some inner child stuff for me. Like this is this is why I feel that way. And I, I received a lot of space as a child. So I, that's what I knew and that's what makes me feel safe now. And so as a relationship progresses, I'm more than happy to integrate lives and I'm more than happy when you, you become safe, safe and secure with a, a relationship that feels safe and secure, right? But like when you're getting to know someone, um, just understanding like, yeah, like it's, I don't know, I think in the beginning you and I were more anxious and I was like, I would just roll my eyes at every avoidant post because I was like, well, I didn't understand. And now I do because I do need time and space to process to feel safe, especially when something is emotional. Even this morning, like I had a girlfriend that I just met. Um, so it's not always dating. Like she sent me like a long paragraph about how much fun she had with me last night and how, cause, you know, I'm decentering men and I'm focusing on female friendships and just living my life and I'll bump into the guy that I'm supposed to be with somewhere. Right. Um, but she sent me this really nice message and it was so hard for me to respond because it was so emotional and I get in my head and I'm like, I want to say the right thing. I want to know, I want to make sure that she knows that I care, but for an avoid, someone who leans, I think more avoidant is um, I, I don't ever ghost, but I will be delayed in my response. Can you speak on that too? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's kind of how I would show up in dating as well. Like for me, when it was really early stages, my rule was like one date a week. That can be any day of the week, as long as it's just one day, because like I have my own life, I have my own things. And that would actually allow me to weed out some of those hyper anxious people who want to go really hard, really fast and want to attach really quickly. And that was part of healing my avoidant attachment style was to have that boundary to say, as much as I want you to choose me and I want you to like be with me for this to realistically work out, we need to be intentional about this. And I would do my absolute best to not coach them, but to try and have control over the pacing of how quickly we got to know each other. And that is another big thing and that I, I kind of want to translate for maybe some of the anxious people listening that, that may take offense to hearing that you don't appreciate when you are their world. What I essentially think about that is it's not necessarily that them choosing you is unattractive. It's that it's a very slippery slope how you can have really good intentions with wanting to get to know this person, immerse yourself in their life that you as the other person forget all about yourself, your needs and your wants. And that can indirectly create resentment in relationships that quite frankly doesn't add to the greater health and longevity of it. And th I think that's something that sometimes a lot of anxious attachers can lose sight of, especially when they meet something or someone really, really amazing and special. They just, they want to have them for themselves. Um, they can lose sight of like their own hobbies, their own life, and they will do things sometimes like lurking this new person's social media, just like having their pictures up on their phone. Even when they're not in contact with each other, they are still in contact with that person vicariously. And it still releases those same attachment chemicals that can verge on unhealthy territory. And to have a healthy 
codependent relationship instead of one that is like verging on unhealthy codependency, it's really important to be intentional with the pacing. And that doesn't mean like, oh, by day three, we have to wait until we sleep with each other or anything like that. Whenever you two hook up or be physical, that is up to you. It's more about like, how immersed are you becoming in each other's lives? When are you taking those serious steps? And what are the reasons behind doing that? And it can be a collaborative process. It doesn't have have to mean that the avoidant is just dictating the pacing or they're the ones that are always in control because that's a comment that comes up in my videos a lot like a lot of anxious attachers will say it's always on the avoidance terms we always have to cater to them and if you feel like you have no control then then that's that's on you essentially i am tough love to my anxious attachers it's it's on you to say okay i feel out of control here how can i get that back instead of blaming the other person realize where maybe boundaries played a role in you losing control of that situation and so that's a tough conversation I commonly have in a lot of my videos. And it was one that I had to have with myself before I could really sympathize with my avoidance side, but also honor the avoidance who were watching my content and coming to me for help. And it was until I had that moment that I realized like, I am catering to one side too much and I'm existing in a vacuum. And when I made that switch, it was, it was crazy how much backlash there was with my followers. Like I was losing some followers, but I was gaining new ones. And that's kind of like the healthy growth that I, I naturally wanted. I didn't want to just cater to one side because I feel like, again, that's a slippery slope as well, where you cater to one side. And you lose out on all of the knowledge and experience that can come from the other, meaning the avoidance side, because they have their own needs, they have their own wants, and sure, they can go about getting those needs and wants in unhealthy ways. I'm not, I'm not retracting from anybody that's been on the receiving end of that, but I am saying that there are situations where we can go about these in a really delicate way that allows both people to show up equally. And that's basically my translation for anybody that may be hearing that and thinking, oh, so we we just have to always cater to them. We can't show up as ourselves. Like, no, that's not it at all. It's like, don't lose sight of who you are as a person. That's the most important thing in any relationship because the moment you do that is the moment you stop being an equal committed couple. It's It's entirely on that other person at that point and that can have devastating consequences. And that's where boundaries are really, really important. And that's, that's why I wanted to ask you about that because as someone that has such experience with like divorce, but also with dating, um, avoidant men, like it's something that I think a lot of people can resonate with because it's not something people are naturally aware of. We weren't taught these things growing up, right? And it's getting to hear other people's experiences allow us to sort of apply that to our lives and try to live more intentionally. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something else I want to add to like, you know, this whole like shift that I've made where like I'm decentering the focus on the male gaze and if I'm going to meet my person. Um, I believe that when I started to feel like I really enjoyed my life more, I became less of an anxious attacher. So um, even when, okay, so like if we're just letting it all hang out here, um, I want no contact with this dismissive avoidant, the Whole Foods guy. Um, we have been on and off for the last year and some change. Did I see him last Saturday? I might've seen him last Saturday, but here's the thing about this is, um, over the time I was more anxious in the beginning, um, because I didn't like my life that much. When we met, I was still living in the marital home. Um, I hadn't like fully... I wasn't on my own two feet by myself. I didn't really like my life. I hadn't found my groove. And now that I found my groove, I know how I like my life more and I'm less anxious. And so there was like, are we in no contact right now? It's a really wonderful question. And I, I had no answer because yes and no. Um, but when we hit like a little bit of a good flow with each other, 
because he's hardcore avoidant and I'm becoming more secure uh, was when I in, to that point of like, well, it's always on the, on the avoidance terms. And I very much felt that way when I didn't like my life and he was just such a force of or such a source of entertainment and joy for me that like, whenever he said jump, I said, how high, whenever he wanted to like show up randomly, I'm like, yes, you're like my dopamine hit. And I love this. And whenever you say, come on, whenever you want to come on over, come on over and I'll just eat you up. Right. Like, cause that was a feeling cause I didn't like my life enough that those dopamine hits provided such an intense high. And the high got less and less when I started really just liking my life, who I am, what I'm, what I'm all about and building something that feels good outside of him being the center of my source of joy. Um, so when we hit a good stride was when, yeah, like he would, uh, and coming back to boundaries, he'd be like, Hey, do you want to go to this concert tonight? And I'm like, actually, you know what? I'm busy. I've got, I'm going out to coffee with a friend this day and this day and this day. And I don't know what all next week I'm going to be home for the holidays. So I really don't know when I'll have time. And it was interesting how, when all of a sudden you don't make them number one or you center them, they kind of panic and you're getting those quick replies and like, wait a minute. Okay, well, fine. You know, actually I can make time in my schedule today. Are you free from, are you free tonight? And before it was like, oh, actually, I think I have plans. It's a Saturday night. I'm going out with friends. Like, okay, yeah, no worries. Like I actually, I don't have time tomorrow and all next week doesn't work either. Um, but yeah, like, I guess we'll see each other. We'll see each other. Then I saw, I saw a shift in his responses to me. I was like, well, wait, actually I can open up my whole calendar. It's free now. So that was interesting. Um, and I'm not saying like use this to manipulate. It's just, it was a natural thing that happened. Like I started getting busier because we went no contact so many times um, that, yeah, I, I had to no choice, but to start liking my life without this person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely not like a, a thing about manipulation. Like it is very much a thing about having your own life, your own desires, outside of the person that you're with, because that should only be an aspect of your life. It's not everything about that. And it, it, indirectly, it can be it can be really difficult for many people to hear, but we indirectly teach people how they can treat us by what we allow them to do. And when we allow people to make plans with us, like making plans last minute, once in a while, that can be nice, can be great. Oh, you bought movie tickets tonight? Sure. Oh, you got these tickets for this concert? Awesome. But when that becomes a cycle, it becomes a habit and a pattern, that is where you indirectly can allow people to think of you as this quick resource for entertainment and support. And when you are firm in your belief and your own boundaries and you have your own things going on, it makes you indirectly appear more valuable. And when people perceive you as more valuable, they are more willing to accommodate you where they know they can get you. And that's kind of one of the things I preach in my client calls is to try and think of yourself as gold and become more scarce with your time and energy. When you do that, more people will do what it takes in order to seek you out. Because a lot of anxious attachers, they deal with that same problem. This avoidant only calls me at like 10 o'clock at night. Don't pick up. Don't respond. He, he, you might find that he tries calling you at different times in the day. Those are the days and times that you respond. And you indirectly tell this other person that this is when I'm available. This is when I'm not. You can either do the direct approach and say, hey, no, I'm busy right now. Or you can do the passive approach and just don't engage. Doesn't mean you're ignoring them, but you have other priorities in your life. And that's what it means to become secure, to understand that this person is important, but they're not the be all and end all. And if they don't like what I'm putting down, then somebody else will be able to adapt with that. And that's all there is to life. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. And I really do resonate with that. I think a lot of people can benefit from that. And that's why being more comfortable with no contact can actually help avoidance learn to realize, oh, I can't just come and go out of this person's life whenever I please. Like, There's going to be times where they reject me, and if I want them, I'm going to have to meet them halfway. And that's kind of how you can indirectly help an avoidant start to heal. 
They may not be doing the intentional work, but indirectly, they will figure it out. They're very smart people. They have feelings. They feel emotions and rejection just like anyone else. And that's kind of where the anxious and avoidant relationship can work if you're willing to just exert your boundaries. And it sounds like that's exactly what you've done. Um, yeah. Kind of like leading into the next questions here, I... I, when I was dating, I always like to ask people, and you reminded me of this, cause like, I always like to ask people like what their attachment style was. And that would usually give me an indication as to how informed they were in terms of their own wounds and their own trauma, but also how they show up in relationships. And usually it was the avoidance that had no idea. Or if they did, they didn't really want to talk about it on the date. And so that was an indication of other things. So I, I'm kind of curious. If you had to date a certain attachment style, um, which would it be? So would you rather date an anxious person or an avoidant person and why? That's a really good question. I think in the past, I would say anxious. I think I would say mm -hmm. anxious in the past um, because I would feel like, wow, you're really not going to leave my side. You know, like my core wounding of a fear of abandonment. Uh, would be just totally understood and I we would see each other and you would be more reliant and dependent on me and that would soothe my feelings, right? That would soothe me. But now after having experience with several very anxious men, um, that was more triggering for me uh, and it made me more avoidant and I didn't like the way that I felt. I actually, so this is interesting. I would, it's, is how it would make me feel. So a more anxious person makes me feel more avoidant. And I don't like the way that that feels in my body. Um, I would rather someone more avoidant make me feel more anxious because then that triggers some sort of a loving response or some sort of something out of me. I would rather feel that than feel repulsed or icked out or like hardcore avoidant. <laughs> And I, and there's things that, that are attractive to me about an avoidant person, because like I said, they're, they're not centering me. They're not, you know, they have their own life. They're, they're probably signed up for, you know, like yoga classes or a fitness class, or like they, they have their own group of friends. And to me, a partner that I would really appreciate spending time with is someone who has like a, a rich and robust full life. And I think a lot of avoidance actually do. Um, whereas maybe someone who is a little more anxious has some work to do to have a happier life. That's just, that's what I would say. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And I, I kind of resonate with that as well. That's kind of been my experience. I think when I was really unhappy and feeling lonely in life, I would have always chosen the anxious person. I would have, because I thought, oh, they would have always been there for me. They would emotionally validate me. They would do all of the things that I want in those moments where I feel my darkest. But when you actually date somebody like that, you realize that there are positive traits to dating avoidant people. And just because they have avoidant traits doesn't mean they're all bad. Like there are benefit traits to, or beneficial traits to dating someone with that style. Like they usually have their own stuff going on, whether that's because it's like um, a creature comfort or a form of escapism, they may still have that Fortune 500 business that they do. Like they may be able to provide support in other ways that isn't just always emotional. Sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's experience experiential. Like there are a lot of other ways you can provide for people in relationships. And so it's really dependent on where you are in life and how you feel about your needs at that time that can dictate that. And so I'm kind of curious, like a lot of people, they tend to put like secure attachment on this pedestal that's perfect and pristine. And I'm kind of curious now that you've become more secure and you understand that it's anything but perfection, what can you tell to people that are trying to seek out securely attached people to keep in mind because it's not like this holy grail of attachment styles. They're not, they're not flawless, right? Like what can you share with them? I think at the end of the day, it's, it's just a spectrum, right? So there's like the autism spectrum. And I think there's a sexuality spectrum where like, I don't think anyone is a hundred percent one way or the other. And I think, it's just under, I think you become a secure person when you understand that like the pendulum is always going to swing, uh, different relationships trigger different sides of us, anxious or 
avoidant. Um, but I think really just knowing like what your core wounding is and what another person's core wounding is can help. Like knowing that you and I can lean more avoidant in our in our everyday life and even like setting appointments for me is really tricky as an avoidant. I have a hard time committing to an appointment. Um, but it's understanding those things and then communicating that outward with my friends, family, and then new partners that I meet, telling them right away so that we can work on it together. I think that is what makes someone secure um, because I don't think perfection exists and I don't think there's ever going to be someone who's just like, yep, yeah, I'm a hundred percent. I think deep down, someone is going to have that core wounding, whether they lean more anxious or they lean more attached, but it's just a person who's like doing the work on it actively is going to be that person who's more secure. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Cause like, as I've become more secure, I've realized like, oh, I still have my days where I just want to go back into my old habits. And sometimes that's a good thing. Like having these anxious or avoidant traits, they actually served us in a time when we needed them most. Like they're kind of like un unwritten superhero abilities in a way where they can they can provide a lot of talent for you when you need them the most. And so they shouldn't be looked at through a lens of shame, judgment, or guilt, the more empathy we can have towards these styles can actually make us more secure in ourselves and how we show up and provide support for other people. So that's, that's really amazing. Like I, I'm so glad like we got to reconnect on all of this, like seeing how far you've come since we were last riffing back and forth about how terrible our dating life was, has been really amazing. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that are going through this right now that will find it really inspiring. So Brittany, we're pretty much at time. So like, thank you for joining us today. It's been so enlightening catching up with you. For all of the listeners and viewers, please share like what you're working on next and how people can find you to stay tuned. Yeah. So if you found any of this interesting or, um, you know, you're just curious about the things that I've learned from divorce and dating relationships, love, life, all of it, um, all the messy edges I have wrapped up so nicely in a memoir that I am going to be um, publishing this year in 2024 called Reaching for Driftwood. Um, that'll be out hopefully um, early summer, late spring. So you can find me there. I have other books on Amazon as well. Just search my name, Brittany Basinski, and then find me on TikTok or on Instagram. Yeah, it's Brittany Basinski there too. So yeah, I'm really excited. This has been so fun. Thank you. We've We've grown like... You know what? Round of applause for me and you. We really a full circle. We're doing the thing. And yeah, if you're listening to this, like Charlie's got a wealth of knowledge. He's a great follow, good guy, and just all around, you know, good heart and has a lot of insight. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Again, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, for anybody that's listening or watching, make sure to connect with Brittany on social media. I'll make sure to link to her socials in the descriptions. And so I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much, Brittany. Thank you. Cheers. Take care.